Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. It's lovely to have you with us. We do hope that you will feel welcome here. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principles and drawn by many sources, including Buddhism, which we're exploring this month in some depth. We do hope that you feel welcome here, whatever you believe or don't believe, whomever you love, however you understand the idea of family, whatever your age or your race or your ability, you are welcome here. We invite you to join us in a journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice making, for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. And we extend a special welcome to any visitors who might be here this morning. We invite you to join us after the service for coffee and conversation. We gather with gratitude this morning on traditional Cree lands, now part of Treaty 6 and shared by many nations. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of the indigenous peoples who have called this land home and who enrich our vibrant community. In the first sermon in the series last week, I described how Buddhism began with a man named Gautama Siddhartha, a wealthy Indian prince. And after a very protected childhood, he became aware of the decay of living things. He became a monk, seeking enlightenment and understanding of all of these things. And following a six-year period of self-discipline and meditation, he achieved enlightenment. And when asked who he was, he replied, I am awake. He became known by the Sanskrit word Buddha, which means to wake. The Buddha then set out to share his path with followers who gathered around him very quickly. He spent the next 50 years of his life running a Sangha with a group of monks, although he was careful to always leave room each day and each year for his own personal spiritual practices. In the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha diagnosed the condition of the world and then offered a prescription for its ailments. The truths were, all life is suffering. Suffering arises from attachments to the illusions we call parts of reality. Suffering ceases when we let go of these attachments, and following his eightfold path is a prescription for achieving enlightenment. And the eightfold path included two intellectual steps, right understanding and right intention. There were three ethical steps, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And the last three steps spoke to mental discipline, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So the Buddha died about 478 B.C., that's 500 years before Jesus. And by the time of his death, this new way of religion had swept across India. In his life, Siddhartha Gautama claimed nothing more than to be a man who had woken up. And he laid out a path that others might follow. One might argue a non-religious path when you really consider them. It's just about thinking the right way and working the right way and all of those sorts of things. It was simple. It was completely devoid of ritual or hierarchy, and it was open to everyone. And yet, Buddhism went on to become one of the world's major religions. Kind of a paradox. It's interesting to look at at what the roots of any of the world's great faith traditions become after their founder dies. There is a consistent occurrence. They split into many groups. In the early Christianity, there was a split between Hebrew and Gentile Christians within decades of the death of Jesus. And then there would be many, many, many splits and divisions to follow. In Islam, the heritors of Muhammad fought over his legacy, forming into what is today primarily Shia and Sunni factions, two groups wrapped often in violent clashes with each other. And over the centuries, their subdivisions continued into dozens on a large scale and hundreds, if not thousands, of groups on a small scale. 
Well, so it was with Buddhism. Within a century, there was a schism, but it did not seem to have the same vitriol or hatred as the other splits I have described. It was more um, a growing apart into different schools of thought and different approaches as the phenomenally successful religion spread through India, but then eastwards into Nepal, Tibet, China, Japan, and the rest of Asia, and eventually around the world. For some reason, lesser leaders, justifiable or not, tend to develop their own interpretations of the founders' beliefs. And things get subtly, one thing gets emphasized, another thing gets left out, and so they end up disagreeing with each other, sometimes quite strongly. And sometimes these divisions are cultural, especially as a religion spreads from one culture to the next. After all, any new phenomenon, whether sacred or secular, changes when it enters a new culture. My favorite example of that is ginger beef in Chinese cuisine. Because I'm sure most of you know that it was invented not in China, but here in Alberta. Seriously. But that's Chinese food. We all think, oh, ginger beef, yeah, Chinese food. There's even restaurants, ginger beef, yeah, okay. But it's a very Canadian interpretation of Chinese cuisine. Well, so it is with religion. It incorporates some of the existing practices, but they change somewhat according to the culture and are changed by them in turn. Today, there are some 250 million Buddhists around the world practicing the tradition in as many different forms as you can imagine. Within uh, about two blocks of my house, there are three different Buddhist temples practicing three different interpretations of that tradition. While much of the Buddha's teachings and truths and paths survive intact, like many faiths, the text supporting Buddhism did not actually appear until a long time after his death, nearly a century most of the stories I told last week and today about his birth and practices come from those later texts. But because his teachings were so carefully organized, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and so on, there are others, the scholars feel safe in saying that many of the direct quotations of the Buddha were things he actually said. By contrast, Liberal Christian scholars believe that about, oh, maybe 10% of the things that Jesus said might have been actually said by him, and they've only all agreed on one small passage. Things change. Houston Smith, the great recorder of world religious diversity, argues that all religions change after the death of the founder because there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all faith. People come in asking different questions. And the job of religion is to answer the questions people bring to them. And those answers, as I said, are affected by cultural variations, and that's what tends to create factions. A first kind of question that people ask of religion, are people independent or interdependent? How much control do I actually have over my own life? What is the impact of upbringing? Do gods rule my fate? Can they even intervene in my life? A second line of inquiry in concerns the relation of human beings to the universe. Is the universe a friendly place? Is it hostile? Is it completely indifferent? Different life experiences will suggest different answers, and that also informs and affects our faith choices. And a third series of questions concerns human nature. What is the best part of a human being? Is it the head or the heart? Classicists rank thoughts above feeling, rank intellect first. Romantics do the opposite. The first seek wisdom, the second seek compassion. But these very different approaches can mark a significant division line in a religion. When one or the other is a critical question for you, then your response to the Buddha's dying words, work out your own salvation with diligence, might be very different from someone holding the other point of view. 
and early Buddhism divided exactly on these two major lines. One group sought progress through wisdom, not cosmic grace. But the others placed compassion above wisdom and looked to a compassionate Buddha for help, nearly deifying him in the process, which probably would have left him giggling an awful lot. In Western terms, these two schools followed the head-heart split that is familiar to us all. Now, both groups became known as yanas, Y-A-N-A, or rafts, carrying people across life's river. The compassionate group appealed to lay people as well as monks, and so from the get-go, they were far more numerous. So they took the name Mahayana, meaning the big raft. The more elitist wisdom seekers were fewer in number, and so they were called Hinayana, or the little raft. Not loving the second-class name that was assigned to them, they soon began calling themselves Theravadan, or the way of the elders. They claimed to represent the original Buddhism, that of Gautama himself. And if we look at the earliest Buddhist text, the Pali Canon, which contains the Buddha's wisdom teachings, we can certainly find a lot of support for their claim. He was a highly intellectual man, very well educated. But the Mahayanists argue that the life story of the Buddha teaches much more eloquently than his words. And for them, the most important fact is that having achieved enlightenment, nirvana, while sitting under the bow tree, the Buddha returned to this life to help others find the path. And that was a supreme act of compassion that made him what they call a bodhisattva, roughly equivalent to the Western word saint. Again, to return to this more familiar story of Christianity, we can see a parallel in these two major approaches. There are those within the Christian tradition who are more intrigued by the divine Jesus and all the complicated theology that develops from believing in the idea of God made man and being raised from the dead. God knows I suffered through listening to enough of them in divinity school. The other school includes people who are more interested in Jesus the man. What he taught, how he acted, what messages his life gives to those who come after. The first tends to be a wisdom tradition, the second a compassionate tradition. Now, about this point in the first draft of my discourse, I started parsing the Buddhist tradition, sort of a family tree that showed all the different schools and how they flourished and which sub-schools grew out in later times and so on, and you can thank me now for deleting all of that. I will happily point you to several articles that will give you all of that dry detail if you so wish. Instead, here are just a couple of generalities and strokes of color. The Theravadan or wisdom tradition holds that once the Buddha reached nirvana, that was it. He was gone for good. I don't know how they explain away the 50 years he was lived after that, but never mind. All that was left of him after he died were his ideas and his wisdom. It is up to us, therefore, to work out your own salvation. And this is accomplished by following the Buddha's path. Meditation, Increasing retreat from the world that is illusory after all. Pursuit of simplicity as one realizes that everything we call real is simply emotional baggage. The challenge is to renounce desire and attachment uh, to this so-called reality. And so the Theravadan path emphasizes the sanghas, which are the orders of monks who run temples and give themselves over to meditation and chanting and living austere lives of great discipline. The Mahayanas have a different take, starting with the Buddha. They still believe that he is available to us all as a bodhisattva or a saint. A simple story illustrates the difference. Four men are crossing the desert and come to a compound surrounded by high walls. One of the four scales the wall and, gazing over the side, gives a whoop of delight 
as he sees a beautiful garden with fruit trees and streams and birds and wildlife. And he jumps down and he disappears. The second and the third do likewise. But the fourth, the fourth climbs the wall, looks over at all this miraculous bounty in the middle of a desert, and then turns back into the desert, hoping to help other wayfarers find their way to this place. And this is a bodhisattva, one who delays their own entry into nirvana until many, many more can find the way as well. The Mahayanas believe that the compassionate Buddha did exactly that and is available to us through prayer to share this grace with us. In the ages that followed, the acts of meditation and self-improvement added on to them prayers of supplication to the Buddha. The development of rituals and religious rites designed to keep followers close. You may have seen Tibetan prayer flags or prayer wheels or things like this. All of these are things that were added in the Mahayana's tradition. In addition to the ancient Pali Canon, the Mahayanas added other texts as authoritative, and they developed a kind of liberal anything-goes approach that included women and lay people as full partners. Sometimes people would go and join a monastery for a week, a month, a year, five years, and then go back to the world and their families. In Buddhism, thus became much more of what we would recognize as a religion than a philosophical practice or meditative discipline. And more importantly, the Mahayana's tradition is more of this world. One doesn't have to retreat permanently and renounce everything. It's all right to work and love and raise a family and care about that family and care about the world in which they live. Illusion is understood differently. It's not all the world or all of what we call reality is illusion. But what constitutes illusion is things like the desire for things that aren't terribly important, like the next best pair of running shoes or the next best promotion or incredible wealth or even moderate wealth that we think is going to make us happy, but which so often doesn't. It's about finding things that really bring us happiness which is often the kinds of connections we find in lighting our chalice or in lighting our candles of joys and concerns. It's about connecting with people, connecting with animals, connecting with nature in a way that moves the spirit. That is cutting through the illusion that we're sold on TV commercials and so on and so forth, or internet commercials, I suppose. Like many of us, the followers of this Buddhist path try to keep one foot in the spiritual world and one foot in the physical and historical world. Houston Smith sums up the development of Mahayana Buddhism this way. In the end, the wheel comes full circle. The religion that began as a revolt against rites, speculation, grace, and the supernatural ends with all of them back in force. As its founder, who was an atheist as far as a personal god is concerned, is transformed into a god himself. Here I wish to do a small side note to note that uh, the rise of Vajrayana Buddhism, called the Diamond Path, it's kind of a combination of the two. It's an esoteric form of Buddhism, dominant in Nepal and Tibet, and familiar to us through the life and work of the Dalai Lama. And in one sense, it's a bridge between the two great traditions. It does emphasize priesthood and chanting and meditation, as we know. Those are its highest forms. It contains a set of practices such as hand gestures or mudras, and more ritual than Theravadan Buddhism. It includes the sand paintings, the incredible sand paintings that show impermanence by monks working for hours, days, weeks on creating the sand painting and then sweeping it all away. But Vajrayana are also of this world. They play some roles in politics. They comment on global and local issues. The Dalai Lama works quietly to encourage Tibetan freedom from Chinese control. However, in this setting, I'm going to stop there and do little more than note that there is this third way that still tries to bridge. Now, as with all religion, there is no way to prove who is the truest Buddhist 
As a Unitarian, I suggest that the development of an austere wisdom tradition and the redevelopment of a supernatural kind of spiritual tradition merely reflect the differing needs of human nature. Some of us need to think it through. Others need to feel our way. Religion inevitably responds to the needs and the wants of the followers who unconsciously or consciously reshape the message in their favor to fit their needs, their culture, their time, and their place. And I will further suggest as a conclusion and as a setup to the third sermon in this series that the Buddhism that came into North American awareness, thanks to a good many Unitarians in the 19th century, ends up being a blending of the two traditions. It begins with the Theravadan wisdom path and meditation, but in the end, the purity of that path has to adapt to a Western world populated by those unwilling to give up their attachments to all of life, all of love, and the things of this world. So stay tuned for part three. Amen. The Golden Chain Prayer. We are a link in Amida's golden chain of love that stretches around the world. We will keep our link bright and strong. We will be kind and gentle to every living thing and protect all who are weaker than ourselves. We will think pure and beautiful thoughts. Say, pure and beautiful words do pure and beautiful deeds. May every link in Amida's chain of love be bright and strong and may we all attain perfect peace. Namo Amida Buddha. Our chalice is extinguished but its light lives on in the minds and the hearts and the souls of each one of you. So carry it with you when you leave this place and share it with those you know, with those you love, and most especially with those you have yet to meet.